For our next feature address this morning, we are honoured to have with us author, historian and curator David Rooney. To introduce him, please welcome Imran Ahmad, Director of Research, Kazana. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, history and time. Now when we think of time and history, we tend to think of history at the macro level the emperor and his empire, the king and his country, the war and the battles. How often do we consider history at the operating level of ordinary people and how they live their lives and what facilities they had? For example, I know that in olden times, people did not have WhatsApp they had something called SMS, which is, stands for Short Message System. They did not have Netflix. They watched DVDs, and in really ancient times, something called VHS. But about time, how did they tell the time? What was their relationship to time? What was their understanding of time? Well, that brings me to our next speaker today, David Rooney is a historian, a museum curator, and a writer. And he is the author of this excellent book, About Time, A History of Civilization in 12 Clocks. And I really recommend that you use your voucher to select this book. Uh, you may not know this, but we Kazana introducers are in competition with each other to promote our respective speakers and their books. So I strongly recommend this book. The other books are rubbish. Um, but uh, in, in this book, David delves into the history of some very significant clocks, clocks uh, powered by the sun, um, clocks powered by water, clocks based on sand, atomic clocks, which are right now in satellites far above our heads, running that GPS system, without which I would be literally and metaphorically lost, because I never ask for directions. But David also speaks about our relationship with time, our understanding of time, and the tyranny of time. We are oppressed by time. We are enslaved by time. I mean, right now, I am suffering the tyranny of time, because if I spend more than five minutes on this introduction, I will be in so much trouble. Literally, I'm terrified of time right now. And in his book, he has an excellent example of the tyranny of time. Apparently, in England, in some factories in the 19th century, workers were not allowed to bring their own watches. They were not allowed to have their own watches because the factory clocks were rigged to measure time more slowly so that workers actually worked for longer than they were credited for and, and paid for, which is extraordinary. Now, I know what you're thinking. Could we implement this in our investee companies to increase productivity? Well, while you ponder that, please welcome David Rooney. Thank you, thank you. Thank you so much, Imran. Um, it's a real uh, honor to be invited to take part in this I have to say a remarkable event. I'm learning a huge amount from each of the sessions. Um, those of you I've already had the pleasure of meeting will have discovered just how quickly I can turn pretty much any conversation around to the subject of clocks. And the rest of you are about to find out. I'd like to start by telling a short story. And it's about something that's going to sound probably depressingly familiar. The themes have been raised many times already at this forum, but I hope you'll stick with it. And the story is about a society that's been ravaged by a deadly pandemic. A society that just as it started emerging from the worst of that pandemic was then plunged into a bloody war in which an independent state was invaded and subjected to violent siege, leaving it fighting for its very existence. And the point of the story I'm going to tell is that this society was forced to confront existential questions. Questions about who it was, about where it was going, 
about how it could come to terms with what had befallen it, but also about the statements that it wanted to make about its new place in the world. This was a society rebuilding its past, yes, but also one that was undergoing a rebirth, a society that wanted to assert its claim over the future. I'm not talking about the 21st century and COVID and Ukraine. My story is from the 14th century. And I'm talking about the city-state of Chioggia, which is an island enclave 15 miles south of Venice. Now, Chioggia thrived for centuries on its salt industry and its fishing industries and as a major commercial port. But I want to take us back to the early 1380s, when the city, once a great and prosperous trading hub, had been utterly devastated. First, the Black Death pandemic had reached the city in the spring of 1348. It had spread quickly, it killed half the population, and it had shattered Kyoja's economy and destroyed its global trading networks. Then in the year 1379, a grueling, centuries-long conflict for economic supremacy between the rival republics of Genoa and Venice erupted into months of bloody siege warfare in Chioggia. The war ended in 1380 only after the death of thousands more Chioggians and ruin for that city. An eyewitness described the aftermath of just one of the battles in the Chioggia War. A fight had reached the piazza near the great medieval city hall. The eyewitness recalled there was great destruction. The piazza was stained red with the quantity of blood of so many killed in a grievous and cruel massacre. Chioggia's pandemic and war cast a long shadow over the city and as it lay in ruins, the task facing its government was the reconstruction of that once thriving economy and the restoration of Chioggia's status as one of Europe's great city-states. Perhaps you can see why I'm telling this story. But it wasn't just about reconstruction. What the city's governors planned as the war ended in 1380 was a new city, built on the ruins of the old, yes, but moving forward defiantly, perhaps even proudly, into the future. A city steering its way through a perfect storm. You must be wondering what this has to do with clocks. Well, it was on the 26th of February 1386 that Chioggia's government gathered in the main chamber of the city hall to record the completion of the installation of a clock. A large public clock installed high up on the tower of city hall, high above the room where they met, its bells having called them to that very meeting. A clock whose face overlooked that public piazza that had been stained red with blood from battle just six years earlier. I'm sure you're the same as me and get very excited by reading old council minutes and committee records. But isn't it a real treat to see here the original handwritten account from 1386 describing in boring and bureaucratic terms what happened at the City Hall that day? Let me read it to you so you can enjoy the full majesty of this discussion. 26th of February 1386, the Major Council, called by the sound of the bell in the great hall of the building, at the presence of 50 people and approval by all but three, stated that the accountants must include in the city expenditures what has already been paid for the clock beyond what has already been deposited by those who promised to finance the operation that the present mayor and the future ones with their minor council will be allowed to spend at their discretion the money needed to keep the clock in, work, in order and working well. Exciting stuff, I think you'll agree. Stirring, even. But it kind of was really important. Kyodja 
had a clock. And this was big news. Now, the last point in those minutes is really significant. This was an expensive clock. All clocks then were expensive because clocks had only been invented a century earlier. This was large, powerful, complex technology, the latest technology available in medieval Europe. It's quite remarkable, I think, therefore, that Chioggia had chosen to spend so much money on a clock then. There'd been huge cutbacks in public spending in the aftermath of the war. Staffing levels at the city council, at the courts, at the jail had been slashed almost by half. Crucial, many crucial posts had been lost. Medics, legal staff, trading standards inspectors. And all the money saved by that austerity was going directly to the rebuilding of the devastated city centre and its infrastructure. So sea defences and forts and mills, salt beds, housing, and the lime kilns needed to support large-scale construction. And yet, amid that austerity, funds were allocated to install a clock and to keep it in good order and working well long into the future. There's something additionally significant today about the Kyoja clock. It's still there. It's still working. It's still at the heart of the city of Kyoja, albeit now mounted on a different building, just a few steps away from its original site. You can see it pictured here. And what's significant about this clock is that it is the oldest clock in the world. There is no clock, mechanical clock, older than this, known to have survived anywhere. If you're interested in the power of clocks to shape our world, and I very much am, and I talk about it at some considerable length in my book, then this is the origin story. You'll find nothing more significant than this clock. So if, you, if that's how I feel about it, imagine how it must have felt 636 years ago when it was first installed and it first began to tick and to sound the hours. What a powerful symbol that clock must have been for the people of Kyoja. With the economy on its knees, the horrors of a brutal occupation, a painful recent memory, and the effects of the pandemic still being felt in every family across the city. What would a clock bring to the city as it was being rebuilt from ruin? How would a clock contribute to Kyoja's rebirth? Well, the piazza, today's Corso del Popolo, held a crucial place in Kyoja's heart, and it does to this day. It had the city hall at its center, and the piazza has always been a proud symbol of the people and of the spirit of the city. A clock looking over the city and sounding its bells each hour took on the identity of the people of Kyoja. The clock was Kyoja's people, and it gave them a voice, a loud voice, and the message that it spoke the clock with its face and its loud bells, the message it gave to the world was one of defiance then. It was asserting Kyoja's confidence, a confidence that had been shaken, but which was emerging once more. It was a message of hope and belief in the long view. So did it work, the Kyojin's long-term view, well, I mean, changes in industry over the centuries. The salt industry's moved elsewhere, fair enough. The fishing industry's still there, but it's nowhere near as strong as it was in the 14th century. But are the Kyojin people still there? Sure. Kyoja still exists with Kyojins in it. Is their independent spirit still there? Absolutely. The clock remains a huge part of the city's identity. They are hugely proud of it, and it's easy to see why, because that clock, six centuries later, is still with them, and it's still working six centuries later. How many machines do you know working still after six centuries of operation? And it still stands proudly for the people of Kyoja. As I discovered when I visited the city in 2018 and met so many people there, from the city mayor to the children of the local primary school, for whom the clock is a huge symbol of pride and identity. 
pride in their city's longevity, its long view. Now, I really could talk for hours about how, and as a time historian, I know that time is relative. So this might go on for a while. Throughout history and across civilizations, humans have made timekeeping devices of all sorts to express our identities and to project to the world, to project to others, a message of order, stability, and the long view. Now, I think a lot about all kinds of clocks, but I think a lot about clock towers. And when I think about clock towers, actually I'm thinking back long before the 13th century invention of the mechanical clock. I think about what the Romans wanted to say in the year 263 BCE when they installed Rome's first public clock. A sundial looted from the city of Catania, mounted high on a column at the heart of the Roman Forum. Rome's first public clock tower, I argue, and it was triumphal, although the locals hated it. I might think of the drum and bell towers of ancient imperial China, where water clocks were used to sound the hours of work and of the nighttime curfew. Across imperial Japan, from at least the 8th century onwards, every major city had its water clock and a tall tower from which time was sounded across the region. Clock towers have, for well over 2,000 years, been part of the ordering infrastructure of societies. And I think a lot in my research and as I explore the cities that I visit about the clock towers built in the 19th and early 20th centuries by the maritime imperial powers of Europe, particularly the British Empire, in the towns and cities of the lands that they commanded. In southeastern Australia, British colonizers began an energetic program of clock tower building in the 1820s, importing Western ideas of discipline and order. In Africa, the first British time signaling towers were built in the 1830s all along the southern coastline. In India, the British clock tower project reached great heights. Britain's grip on India tightened hard in the late 1850s following the bloody uprising in 1857 against its rule. In 1858, after the rebellion had been suppressed, the new direct rule of the British Raj brought sweeping changes across the region. Building construction formed a crucial part of that program, and tall clock towers with loud bells chiming the quarters and striking the hours across those towns and cities. British-made clocks sounding the Westminster chimes played a vital symbolic role. They were commissioned for every major town occupied by the Raj. And these clocks were impossible to miss. That was their point. One example... The clock tower built in the 1870s as part of Mayo College, a new boarding school campus at Ajmer in today's Rajasthan, intended to be the Eton School of India, really, I think, showed the power of clocks to represent the ruling classes by proxy. It was nearly 30 meters in height, the Mayo College clock loomed over the area. It was visible to anybody approaching Ajmer long before the city itself came into view. And just take a look at it. It was topped by a huge metal crown sent over from Britain, just like the one worn by Queen Victoria, who was proclaimed Empress of India in 1877, the year that construction of Mayo College began. The clock tower was the Empress, Queen Victoria. She was there. That, I argue, was its purpose. And here in this wonderful city, my first visit, when I arrived on Sunday, I went to look at the Sultan Abdul Samad building, and I saw its British-designed clock tower. The clock mechanism, I believe, was made by the Gillett Company of Croydon in South London, 
and its bells sounded across KL for the first time in June 1897 as part of the city's Diamond Jubilee Parade for Queen Victoria amid countless Union Jack flags and the singing of the British National Anthem, God Save the Queen. When they built clock towers, the Imperial British were saying confidently, we're here and we're here to stay. Now, I'm not making causal or predictive statements here. Building monumental clocks for the long term does not guarantee the survival of the society or worldview that created those clocks. The British Empire disintegrated. And as the KL clock struck midnight at the start of the 31st of August 1957, the Union Jack in front of it was lowered and the new country's flag was raised to shouts of Merdeka, independence, freedom, by the crowd of tens of thousands as lights on the clock were lit up. But even if the project fails, the clocks usually remain as physical manifestations of predecessors still living among us and still telling us their stories should we care to listen. The question is, the question that's possibly at the heart of this conference is, what do we want to say to our successors? Of course, not every clock stands so publicly, so visibly and powerfully for the long term as the Kyodja clock of 1386 or the 19th century imperial clock towers of the former British Empire. I found myself studying yet another old clock tower uh, for, the, for the book. Uh, this one was built in the heart of the Dutch capital of Amsterdam in the year 1611, and it was attached to the world's first stock exchange. It was there to control the hours of trading and to timestamp financial transactions. This was the clock that sounded the birth of financial trading and therefore in many ways the birth of capitalism. And by studying its early 17th century mechanism, which now lies abandoned in a church loft elsewhere in Amsterdam, I found myself led to some clocks built only in the last few years, which sit at the heart of today's financial trading exchanges. And these clocks, hidden behind high fences, razor wire, CCTV cameras, and tight security, it is true to say that when I took this photograph, I was being chased by a security guard. Those clocks do not claim to be for the long term. They could not be more short term if they tried. I hardly need to tell this audience about today's computerized trading in financial instruments, stocks, or futures, or whatever, and particularly the form known as high-frequency trading, now accounting for, I believe, over 50% of stock trading in the USA. And as its name suggests, and as you will all know, high-frequency trading is all about speed, making huge numbers of trades every second. The individual trades are usually very small, and the profit on each is also tiny, but because of the sheer volume of them, the profits can build up into a sizable amount. But this isn't about holding investment positions for weeks or months or years. It's about seconds and milliseconds and microseconds. The computer servers that handle these financial trades sit in anonymous buildings called data centers like this one in London, near me, called Telehouse. And whilst I always used to overlook them as I passed them by, now, having learned what they do, the role they play in society, I pay a lot of attention. I now know how profoundly significant these sites are. They are today's equivalent of the 17th century stock exchange in central Amsterdam. And like Amsterdam, they're run by clocks. Now more than ever, clocks enable regulation to happen in the high-speed financial markets. That's what Amsterdam's stock exchange clock did. That's what the clocks in today's data centers do. One risk with high-frequency trading is that firms with computers trading effectively at light speed might be able to see the financial markets a tiny split second earlier than competitors, 
It might enable them to profit on the information they saw in that tiny window of time. In some circumstances, that might be illegal. So what regulators need is, after the fact, to be able to read back the sequence of every trade to make sure that nobody was breaking any rules and unfairly jumping the queue. So all the trades need to be time-stamped. So it's clear what happened when and what, be what came before or after what. And it's in data centers like these that the time stamping takes place. I've been inside Telehouse uh, legally. The security guards stopped chasing me. I've seen the master clock that keeps all of the other clocks and servers in line. I can't show you a picture of the clock because of the high security. It's certainly not a pretty clock if you're a clock lover or a clock collector and care about pendulum clocks and the golden age of horology, but it's a powerful clock. And what astonished me was to learn the fine detail of what was needed with these financial clocks. In Europe, timestamps for high frequency trades must not deviate from true time by more than 100 millionths of a second. And those timestamps need to have a precision, the gap between successive stamps of no more than one millionth of a second, a microsecond, a million stamps per second. And those timestamps need to be found identically on every chip, in every computer server, in every trading exchange across the entire European financial market. The technical requirements to achieve that are remarkable. And yet, without those clocks, the markets would fall apart. But there's more, of course. The clocks that power the markets, atomic clocks of the most remarkable accuracy, are also the type of clock that keep the entire modern world working. High accuracy atomic clocks are at the heart of every modern infrastructure. They're the pacemaker for everything from transport networks, power supply, telecoms, IT, increasingly agriculture, banking, in fact, every digital system controlled by computers. Wherever you look in the modern world, you'll find infrastructures locked onto the signals from atomic clocks. And as Imran mentioned, almost inevitably, that means atomic clocks located on navigation satellites. GPS, the American military system, is the oldest and most well-known sat-nav network, providing accurate time signals as well as position to users and infrastructures on Earth. All that GPS satellites are, are flying clocks. But we also rely on clock signals from the Russian military GLONASS system, the Chinese military Beidou system, and Europe's Galileo network. The infrastructures that keep us alive with food on our plates and roofs over our heads only work because of high precision atomic clocks flying over us in mostly military satellites. The clock on the screen is the flight spare for the first atomic clocks in space, deployed on a trial mission for GPS in 1974. Again, hardly pretty, but powerful. And yet they're vulnerable. The time signals from clocks on GPS satellites far out in space are weak. They've for a long time been easy to jam. You can buy jamming equipment on the web for a few dollars. Since 2017, those signals have also been spoofed. That's where a false signal leads SatNav receivers to think they're somewhere other than their true location. In November 2021, in the build-up to Putin's invasion of Ukraine, the Kremlin claimed it had developed the capacity to destroy the entire American GPS fleet with space-borne missiles. Who am I to say whether that's true or not? But it was reported that debris from Russian missile tests at the time forced the International Space Station's astronauts and cosmonauts to deploy emergency avoidance procedures. We rely more and more as a society on high-precision atomic clocks, clocks that only live in the present moment. 
In the world of financial trading, timestamps with an accuracy of microseconds or millionths of a second are already outdated. Scientists running a timestamping service in Britain told me their systems could stamp time to billionths of a second because some firms are now trading on the financial markets at the speed of nanoseconds. The scientists' own clocks back in the laboratory, currently experimental but soon going mainstream, are keeping time at a femtosecond scale. That's quadrillionths of a second. Now, it's not for me to make any pronouncements about the value of high-frequency trading or a society that's divided up into femtoseconds. The modern world is complicated, it's ever-changing, and I do firmly believe that innovation drives humankind forward. But it must also prompt us to think. I was reading the concept paper that was written for this forum, and very thought-provoking it was too, and I cheered when I came to the part that said Technology is not something that is entirely imposed upon us. We must choose what technology makes sense for our needs at a given time. Too true. When we think about what clocks do in the modern world, we're forced to confront the power that the people who build and deploy those clocks are exercising. When it comes to power, we have choices. Those satellite clocks that keep the modern world working, they enable so much, they've benefited humankind in profound ways. But with them, we have made a brittle world. So, choices. What clocks do we want in our societies? We've already seen how clocks have always been used to pass on messages into the future. Well, what messages do we want to pass on with our clocks? More fundamentally, how can the clocks we make prompt long-term thinking and action? Well, this idea, too, has a long history. The Japanese city of Ise is home to the Ise Jingu, or Grand Shrine, a complex of 125 Shinto shrines covering an area the size of central Paris. The first shrine buildings were built there in the 7th century. But the structures you can visit there today are only a few years old. And that has been the case for over 1,300 years. Every 20 years, since the year 692, the wooden shrine buildings at Ise have been totally rebuilt. The most recent ceremony in 2013 was the 62nd rebuilding. About 100 local craftspeople are entrusted with the process, and it takes eight years each time. You can consider the Ise Jingu as a clock, a very long-running clock, marking the passage of time and helping us come to terms with the passage of time. The American writer and thinker, Stuart Brand, said, Ise is the world's greatest monument to continuity, an unbroken lineage of structure, records, and tradition. Its ancient rites are alive and meaningful. He also said this nearly 25 years ago. He said, civilization is revving itself into a pathologically short attention span. The trend might be coming from the acceleration of technology, the short horizon perspective of market-driven economics, the next election perspective of democracies, or the destructions of personal multitasking. All, he says, are on the increase. Some sort of balancing corrective to the short-sightedness is needed, some mechanism or myth that encourages the long view and the taking of long-term responsibility, where the long-term is measured at least in centuries. Since the late 1990s, Stuart Brand has worked with the computer designer, Danny Hillis, and other prominent thinkers to develop a mechanical clock, the size of a great monument. The prototype, completed in the year 1999, is now on display at the London Science Museum, 
where I used to work, and the full-size version is currently being built in Texas. That's Danny and Stuart working on a part of the prototype. And this clock that Danny Hillis described as both a mechanism and a myth will be capable of keeping time for at least 10,000 years if it's looked after and cared about by the civilizations that have custody of it. Like the Ise Jingu, the 10,000-year clock is a performance, a slow performance. It's a long-running conversation, a conversation about our future, how long it might be, whether we'll be in it, but also an optimistic statement of faith that humankind will continue, will continue rebuilding the shrine, will continue winding the clock. Repeated attention surely is the recipe for long-term survival. Performance encourages permanence. The people of Kyoja emerged from a deadly pandemic and then a war in 1380, and they decided to make a powerful statement by erecting a clock to speak for the people with a loud and defined but optimistic voice over the long term. And six centuries later, the clock keeper still winds it every week. The clock keeps ticking, and it still keeps time. And with its ancient bell, it still speaks loudly every hour, even when storm clouds gather. And there I was, looking out over Kyoja, as the clock had done for six centuries, and uh, here I am sharing its story with you, what a wonderful group of people, thinking about what we might want to say to our descendants as we steer our way through a perfect storm. But I can see the clock in front of me is counting down inexorably to the end of my slot. It's been an absolute pleasure uh, sharing some time with you and talking to you this morning, but it's certainly time that I shut up and let some conversations happen. So I will, and I'll say thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you for keeping to time. By the way, uh, I get into trouble if you overrun. Th this entire event is subject to the tyranny of time, as you know. I'm, I'm going to ask the first question because I'm, the mo I'm your introducer. You know, the fundamental question of evolutionary biology is what came first, the chicken or the egg? If we apply the same principle into this domain, I'd like to ask you, what came first, standardized time or the clock? That's a really good question. That's a really profound question, actually. Um, I mean, the short answer is the clock came first. The clock came way first. I mean, in the book, I make the point that when I talk about the word, when I use the word clock, in the West, that tends to mean those mechanical clocks invented in the 13th century. But I use the word to mean any timekeeping device developed by humans to make sense of the passage of time. So that includes sundials and water clocks and time-finding telescopes. And the earliest clocks in that sense are over three and a half thousand years old. Uh, water clocks followed soon after by sundials uh, from places like Egypt and Babylonia. The clock came way first. The time that would be told on clocks or sundials was the time where you were. Of course, time varies as you move geographically, and local time was time until the 19th century when technological developments in transportation and communication, the railways, steamships, electric telegraphs, and everything that followed, meant that more and more people were connected over longer distances and it started to make sense to choose one time to apply across a, a large geographical area, possibly a whole country, to say, in the case of the UK, never mind what the local time is where you are, the time will be the time in London, and everyone will keep to that time. That idea very soon spread around the world. In 1884, there was a conference in Washington, D.C., 
the International Meridian Conference, which selected one time for the whole world, which was to be the time in London. Now, the world was free to choose whether to take that idea up and the idea of time zones, one hour offsets or multi hour offsets from Greenwich time. And many chose not to for many years. But isn't that an intensely political act to standardize time, to say, never mind the time where you are, that you live your lives by, that you live agricultural lives or religious lives by, closely tied to the patterns of time where you are, to say you will keep time according to some other place, the time of some other people. And as that idea expanded, it became really profound. What a political act that is. I mean, I mentioned a couple of examples in the, in the book, of course. Um, in the 20th century, one of the first acts in 1949 of Mao Zedong was to standardize China's time to Beijing time. Now, China is about five hours of time wide, but it has one time zone, and it's Beijing time. Beijing is in the east. So if you live in the west of China, does the time in your clocks bear any relation to the time where you are? It doesn't at all. It was a highly political act um, of identity, of political control. Um, we see this all over the place. But people have also resisted. Standardization of us breeds dissent, resistance. And I talk also about examples in the 19th and 20th centuries of people resisting the tyranny of standardized time. Sorry, I can't give a short answer to anything. Um, well, the talking of tyranny, I need you to hurry up. <laughs> the, uh, for an example, and I'm resisting that tyranny, an example in uh, India, in uh, Bombay, in the 1890s, today's Mumbai, the 1890s, the British rulers tried to impose a standard time on Bombay. Actually, it was Madras time, and it was resisted, in some cases violently, by the people of India. A few years later, the Brits tried to impose Indian standard time, five and a half hours from Greenwich time. Again, it was violently resisted. Because time stands for all kinds of things like national identities, friends, enemies, and we end up fighting a proxy war with time and clocks. We care deeply about time because it stands for so many things to do with ourselves, our identity, and politics. Yeah, that's certainly something I learned from your book, that uh, things I took for granted as being somehow natural are actually not. They are man-made and then imposed on us and then programmed into us. Um, that's, it's all really quite extraordinary. Um, we'll move on to uh, a question I've got there from Dowd Vickery. He must, he's uh, very tall. I don't know if he's in the room, actually. But he says, first of all, lovely to hear the tones from the Northeast. We rarely get <laughs> people from your part of the world, <laughs> as opposed to London. <laughs> and um, how will the mastery of time impact on future human development? That's a really great question. Um, and it, it, it may be possible to discern, if you read the book, or even if you just listen to what I've been saying today, that somehow I'm against these highly technical, highly advanced clocks. And I'm not. I think clocks are amazing. And I think what clocks have enabled in the world is remarkable. But we've talked about winners and losers, haven't we? And we've talked about if clocks are about the exercise of power, if they're about power structures, then we need to see them for that reason. So I think clocks are complex, and there are winners and losers. And so in terms of future human development, I'm really interested in seeing a mixed economy of these super accurate femtosecond scale clocks, which enable so many technologies and infrastructures to work and make the modern world work, but also these long-term, long-thinking clocks, like the clock of the long now, the 10,000-year clock, and many others, to help us think on that longer view so we don't get caught up in the time horizons given by these super accurate clocks. So for me, the future involves clockmakers without a doubt, uh, but uh, clockmakers making clocks of all kinds, I think. Okay, we, we can take a question from the floor. I think number five over there. 
Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I would like to resist the tyranny of time, and I'll introduce myself as a biologist. So, so humans didn't invent the clock, obviously, because time was invented by life itself. So we have biological clocks, the clock, environmental clocks, the circadian clock. How do you reconcile our need to control time with nature's natural clock, especially when we talk about climate change and how nature is changing its clock all the time in response to, you know, natural clock. So, you know, we, so even human wellness, to me, has got it wrong by trying to control time according to one standard, whereas every person has his personal clock. Uh, thanks for that question, which, again, is um, profound. Um, the relationship, if I discern it correctly, the relationship between clock time and natural time um, is something that interests me greatly. And there's an example of where those two ideas are coming into collision, which is being kind of fought out right now at the fairly high reaches of the UN, which is going to sound very abstract, but it's the idea of the leap second. The clocks that keep time for us for all these timescales that keep infrastructures working is, is purely artificial clock time from atomic clocks. But those clocks run at a different rate and, in, at, and a diverging rate from the time of the rotating Earth, which is the time that we experience as animals, um, daylight and darkness and the seasons. Now, the two timescales, natural time, Earth rotation time, and atomic time, have been tied together pretty much since the invention of atomic clocks by this device, this, this technical fudge called the leap second, which is whenever the two timescales are diverging by more than, well, nine-tenths of a second, uh, a leap second will be inserted to bring them back into step. And this is because there was a recognition that natural time cycles are important to us just as much as this highly artificial time, there's a proposal that's been doing the rounds in the UN, which decides on kind of timescale policy, to sever the link, to abolish the leap second system. Now, I could really talk for a lot longer than nine tenths of a second about this, and you'll have to um, pull me off um, with uh, Shepard's crook. But isn't it interesting that this idea, which is being put forward, the idea of technological utility and efficiency, systems will work better if we abolish this system, would be a profound step in human development, and I would hope that it would be at least resisted. Well, on that revolutionary note, we are literally, so sorry for the cliche, out of time. Uh, we, no, but we are, according to the message on the screen there. <laughs> so, thank you so much. That's, that's really been profound. I've, I read your book, and I, it really made me think about things and understand what I'd been programmed with as opposed to what was natural out there. And that was um, just fascinating. So thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you.